In this video, I'm going to explain why blowing up a balloon in the proper position of your body is the best vagus nerve exercise that you can do. There are a lot of videos out there teaching you to stimulate your vagus nerve. And the reason that this is a popular thing is because the vagus nerve is the major conduit into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the more rest and digest state. Now I'm going to demonstrate how to blow up the balloon in a proper position at the end of the video, but I highly rec recommend that you do not skip to the end and that you listen to the conversation that I'm having with a, a gentleman named Skip George. He is a chiropractor, but he's also an instructor for the Postural Restoration Institute. He teaches the Postural Respiration course and also the Cervical Revolution course, which is all about the neck. And in this video, in our it's maybe a 10 minute discussion, we're talking about the inability for people to expand their chest wall with air. They're compressed, particularly through the right side. And when you're compressed through that right side, you can't diaphragmatically breathe with your left diaphragm because as I've shown many, many, many times, the left diaphragm and the right diaphragm are not the same. When the right chest wall is compressed, you cannot breathe with your left diaphragm effectively. So you could do all the vagus nerve stimulation exercises that you want to do, but if you're not in the position to actually diaphragmatically breathe, I don't know how effective they're going to be. The neck has a direct relationship with breathing and especially with oftentimes an over-reliance on accessory muscles of respiration. Now in postural respiration, as you know, we really take a close look at, for instance, the scalenes and the scalenes lifting ribs, especially on the right side, scalenes go from the cervical spine to the ribs underneath the collarbone. That accessory muscle overuse, especially in athletes that are younger, uh -huh. but over time, everybody tends to have an accessory overuse uh, or an overuse of accessory muscles. So that pulling up on a rib cage, and as you know, uh, rib cages on the right tend to be less inflated in the chest wall than in the left. And so that overuse of neck muscles has a direct effect on the position of the cervical spine all the way to the atlas. Atlas and the occipital bone, that's where brain stem is, but also it's a place where so much of our vestibular ocular reflex begins. That integration of balance and movement with vision, even hearing. So now you see that the neck starts getting affected. We get a different proprioceptive change in the entire system. And then we have to adapt and compensate. Mm -hmm. And then over time, maybe it's an accessory muscle overuse that affects that whole chain of muscles into the cranium, even the little suboccipital muscles, part of the TMCC chain, the uh, capitis muscles, um, the longissimus muscles. So we'll see people that show up with reversed cervical curves, whether or not they've had trauma or not. Right. Well, what's driving that? Right. Typically it can be a respiration pattern or a pattern of respiration and over-reliance on one side of our body and the inability to shift, let go of those muscles that are holding us and shift back and forth. We call that alternation. Uh -huh. So kind of in a long story short, we'll find a way to compensate, to be able to function in a three-dimensional world but we do it in a way that we pay a price. We pay a price, absolutely. Yeah. So, so some people say, or they're they're kind of, they have a hard time believing that you know something extreme. Well, yeah, we'll just call it kind of extreme. But they're experiencing ex extreme pain. Uh, could have have its origins in the fact that you know you just your the left side of your pelvis came forward, you shifted to the right. And then it traveled all the way up. Like that's how I ended up with a forward head posture. And it's like, yeah, that can happen. And so it's important, again, it's important for people to realize just 
and they may be, they may be familiar with my story, so they know about my eyes and my jaw and everything. You can end up in this forward head type of posture simply just through normal respiratory dysfunction. And I remember my first dysfunction when I was roughly 12 or probably 11 or 12. I remember going to basketball games at uh, Seton Hall University and sitting in the narrow seat. And at that point in my life, I felt like I couldn't get a good breath in. And I would just breathe and breathe. And eventually I'd get one in and I'd like, oh, okay, I feel better. Now I know what was probably happening at that point. I was probably turning into a superior T4 at a very young age. But that was my earliest memory of dysfunction was the inability to breathe properly. And that can come from a lot of different things, especially think about overhead athletes, people who throw too much. And now they're overused. Once that right scapula becomes a little bit disengaged, so to speak, from the thorax, how are they controlling that arm? Now you've got a lat and an upper trap. And just could you mention how that sequence of events could now lead to the things that we're talking about? Well, first off, you demonstrated something that was just perfect. Perfect. When you were trying to get an air in yeah. or get a breath in, get air in. And what you did was you extended back and your shoulders lifted a little bit. No, I didn't do that on purpose. I wasn't doing that. I was just, that's really what I had to do. So just that, that's called extension. Yeah. You're using your back muscles to try to lift a rib cage to get air in, especially your right side. Um, now, I just wanted to back up a little bit what you were talking about integrating this whole system. And in other words, how does a pelvis affect a cranium? Hmm. We have to remember this, that our bodies are an environment, just like the environment we live in. And that you cannot change one part without affecting the whole. That's a huge concept that people, everyone says everything's connected, but they don't really believe it. It's true. It's true externally. It's true internally, mentally, emotionally, physiologically, biomechanically. So the problem with it is we try to oversimplify. And we say, well, it's just this or just that. For instance, chiropractors, and I'll be the first to admit it, let's just adjust Atlas and that'll fix, fix the whole show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might get somebody feeling better, but... I want to look at the whole system. So going back to breathing and what you were doing, overhead athletes, for instance, and being able to actually have full motion, whether you're a water polo, a pitcher, volley, whatever it is, volleyball player, tennis, to be able to have good position of an, a humerus and a scapula is dependent upon a mobile rib cage. And a mobile rib cage is dependent upon how, and that form and that function of that rib cage is really dependent upon how we deliver air pressure into a chest wall. We call it having a sense of air pressure, becoming aware of, yeah, one side of your body needs to shift and you, while you do that, you actually have to pump air into a chest wall for a little while. So you have free motion of a rib cage, a spine, an arm, and movement performance. Whether that's just walking down the street or you're serving a 140 mile an hour tennis ball. Mm. So this dynamic balanced motion of a rib cage, becoming aware of that is something we talk about in PRI. It's like you, it's, it's, a, it's an approach that says, let's become aware of your inherent tendencies and show you what the possibilities are for movement and function so that you don't have to rely on a limited position that over time creates wear and tear on your structures and pain. I think it was the Czechoslovakian, either Kolaj or Levitt said that breathing is the most common movement dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So breathing is hot topic, right? Sport performance rehab. 
but like yeah. that's like the big deal, right? Techniques on how to breathe. Well, I dig it. There's great techniques how to breathe. Yeah. But your rib cage and your ribs are the most dynamic bones in your body because they're moving eight to 12,000 times a day. Every time you take a breath, they're moving a little bit. And they have habitual tendencies. In other words, a posture or position, they will move toward and get stuck in. So in other words, the rib cage on the right side, and remember I was talking about buying a pair of pants and seeing all the models on the computer screen with the right shoulder down, they hang out like this. Well, that's a function of our brain taking us over to the left side, for, to the right side that is, our left brain taking us to the right side, but it's also a function of respiration. It's a function of how we direct air into our thorax. And it's different right to left side because the diaphragm is different left to right side. So this chest wall will have a tendency to be more deflated than the left chest wall. Right. And then because of that deflation of that right chest wall versus the left chest wall, that puts a twist in your spine. And the twist is typically to the left, especially above your eight thoracic vertebra. And so you have a tendency to rotate more to the left than to the right. Now, we talked about a couple of minutes ago, yeah, you'd love to stand on the right side of your body, but the counter rotation in what we call that position is really a left position thoracic spine on a deflated right chest wall. The goal of PRI is to get, for instance, what you and I talked about. Let's get a pelvis in a proper position with a left hamstring. Let's get our breathing, our exhalation right with our IOs and TAs, our abdominal wall muscles, and to get a full exhalation on the left side in order to create a different shape on the left side of the diaphragm so we can consciously direct air into the right chest wall. And as you consciously direct air into the right chest wall, rib movement, then you can realize more performance or movement, whether it's an overhead sport or whatever you're doing. And the key then is to go back and forth. Right. Now, you were mentioning your job in the past when you're in this constricted room doing tech work. There isn't a whole lot of movement for the human body. We're meant None. to move. None. You got to move. Yeah. And so, you know, we expect to go out on the weekends and, you know, hit par golf when we sit on our butts all week, a rotational sport yeah. when we can't even breathe because every time we take a breath in, we extend. We're, we have to use accessory musculature over time because having a sedentary life you'll take a breath in take a breath in take a breath in take a breath and never get a full breath out right. so if you want breathing technique let's start with getting a full relaxed as exhale out further than you ever thought before uh -huh. relaxing for about four or five seconds and then without using your neck muscles simply take a breath in to now push air into the rib cage, not try to lift it with back muscles or neck muscles. Right. Even the most simple looking exercise or non-manual technique in PRI has so many parts and subtleties. And going back to where we started with this conversation, I think, Neil, you can get a 90-90 hip lift with a balloon an overhead reach, and it looks like it's a pelvis, hamstring, apical expansion technique, but you are affecting your cervical lordosis, you're affecting your cranial bone rhythm, position of the occipital bone, sphenoid, temporal bones, jaw, even vision, and not even knowing it. Right. Which, which is pretty astounding, I think. It can so. take, all it takes sometimes is one good breath and the whole system gets reorganized.
So in order to blow up the balloon, what you're going to do is put yourself in the position that will enable you to open up this right side, this right chest wall, in the same way that we were talking about in the video. So that's why this technique actually exists in postural restoration. So you want to sit in a chair that's not too high. Your knees need to be level with your hips or slightly, uh, slightly higher than your hips. You don't want your knees too low because if your knees are below your hips, you'll probably sit with your back slightly arched and we want your back to be rounded. I have my arm on a table. You could, if your chair has an armrest, you could just use the armrest, but mine doesn't. So I'm putting my arm on a table and then I'm elevating it slightly. And the reason I'm doing this is because it helps lift up my right shoulder and my right scapula. We need to get, we're sitting like this, we're living like this. We need the right side to rise up. So what I'm doing is I'm helping support my shoulder and my scapula to help get air underneath that right side while I'm blowing up the balloon. It also helps to tip me over to my left side because we need to close the left side down as we're doing this. So what am I feeling for? I want to sense my left sit bone or both sit bones, but, but hopefully the left a little bit more. And also as I'm blowing into the balloon, I want to feel my left abdominals because my ribs on the left side are coming down and in. And then I have to hold that position as I inhale. And if I can do that, air will have to flow into the right side because we're closing the left side. So the air is flowing into the right side to open up the right side of that rib cage and lift the right shoulder. Now the key to this is your tongue. After you blow into the balloon, you're going to pause for five seconds and to prevent the air from going back into your mouth, you're going to put your tongue to the roof of your mouth, right, right behind your front teeth, not touching the front teeth, but right behind the front teeth, your tongue is, touch, is up against the roof of your mouth and that will prevent the air from going back into your mouth. You don't want to have to squeeze the balloon and you don't want to have to bite down on the balloon to prevent the air from going back in. You want to use your tongue because that would be top, uh, proper tongue position with ribs on the left side that are down and now you have a diaphragm that can be used with proper tongue position and as air is flowing into the right side of your rib cage. So we're integrating all of these various components. So this is what it looks like. And that's the technique. So again, I'm feeling my left abdominals activate. I'm sensing my sit bones, particularly my left sit bone, and I'm feeling air opening up the right side of that rib cage. And that is how your vagus nerve will know that you're finally using your diaphragm again and that your chest wall is expanding. So that should help your entire, entire vagal system get better.